A History of the Yoruba People S. Adabanji Akindi The Frontier Effect The southern border of the Yoruba homeland is the Atlantic coastline. To the west, north and east, are land frontiers with non-Yoruba neighbors. The types of relationships that developed along these land frontiers played very significant parts in the history of what we may call the Yoruba frontier kingdoms. While the frontiers in general constituted grounds for cultural and economic interfertilization, the Yoruba frontier kingdoms, along most stretches of the frontiers, and for most of their history, also lived under military and political pressures from formidable, hostile, neighbors. By and large, faced with these pressures, the affected kingdoms developed strengths that enabled them to survive and, in one important case, to overcome and subdue the hostile neighbors for some centuries. Along the Western Frontier the Western frontier had a character entirely its own. Much has earlier been said in this book about the relationship of the Western Yoruba and their Asia neighbors. In summary, settlements of the Yoruba and Asia early became interspersed and this had resulted in much cultural affinity between the two peoples long before the Yoruba began to create kingdoms, starting with Ife in the 10th or 11th century. From the late 16th century, the Asia people also began to create kingdoms, closely patterned after the Yoruba kingdoms. Of these, the most important were Sevi of which Wita was a dependent port town, and Wem, both on or near the coast, Alida, or Ardra, about 20 miles inland from the coast, and Dahomey, whose capital town, Abomi, lay still further inland on the Abomi Plateau. As Savis port town of Wita became a major center of the slave trade in the course of the 17th century, the whole Savi kingdom came to be referred to as Wita. Alida was the earliest to be founded, in about 1575 and was generally regarded by the Asia people as father of all their kingdoms. In general, these kingdoms were strongly influenced by Yoruba culture and had substantial Yoruba populations. In fact, the Fon leadership groups of the Dahomey Kingdom, founded in 1625, emerged from a mixture of Asia and Yoruba elements. Not long after it came into existence, the Dahomey Kingdom began to exhibit great ambition. By the late 17th century, it was already causing anxiety for its neighbors, Yoruba and Asia alike. Dahomey pushed towards the coast and brought pressure to bear on all its neighbors. Its aggression forced many people, both Yoruba and Asia, to migrate eastwards into the Igbado country, resulting, as would be remembered, in the emergence of new towns there as well as in increases in the populations of some old towns. At this point, the Oyo-Ila kingdom from the northeast, by then a very strong power, entered the scene. Oyo armies swept through the area and the Yoruba and Asia kingdoms there, including Dahomey, became tributary to Oyo-Ila. The details of all this belong to a subsequent chapter. Oyo-Ila continued in control until the last years of the 18th century when, because of internal and other problems, its hold began to weaken. This gave Dahomey the chance to re-emerge with considerable strength, and thus to become a great threat to all of the kingdoms of Western Yoruba land in the 19th century as will be seen in our chapter on that century. Along the Northern Frontier Along the Yoruba Northern Frontier, their neighbors were the Bariba and the Nup, two peoples of the banks of the river Niger. Between these peoples and the Yoruba, much cultural interfertilization occurred throughout their history. Not only were the Nup and Yoruba closely related during their evolution into distinct groups, they thereafter remained very special neighbors to each other. Along the southern banks of the Niger, early settlements of Bariba, Nup and Yoruba people lived side by side, in some cases, in fact, Yoruba, Oyo and Bariba elements occupied the same villages in the western parts of the Middle Niger Valley, while Yoruba, Oyo and Igbamana, and Nup elements inhabited the same villages in some areas in the eastern parts of the valley. The Nup were the closest trading partners of the Yoruba from the north. The fact that the Nup lived on both the northern and southern banks of the Niger, their main population concentration being in the northern banks, gave them great influence over the river crossings and made them the major connection between Yoruba land and the countries beyond the Niger. In language, in religion, in their styles of clothing, and in a large spread of other cultural practices and customs, centuries of very close relationships resulted in profound similarities between the Yoruba and Nup. Yoruba traditions acknowledge Nup inputs into significant features of important Yoruba institutions such as Ifa divination and Igungun, while Nup traditions acknowledge Yoruba origins of such institutions as the Ogboni cult and facial markings among the Nup. Countless family ties straddled the ethnic boundary between the Nup and the Yoruba a factor of considerable importance in the evolution of political institutions and titles among the two peoples. Of foreign traders on Yoruba soil, only Nup women traders were usually admitted to membership in leading positions and market commodity associations. Yet, political frictions characterized the relationship of these peoples in the frontier areas. 
Aribides Usman has identified two broad periods in the development of these frictions. First, in the early history of Igbomen and Noop settlements, only small, local frictions commonly occurred minor frictions over land, water and other resources between neighboring villages or village groups. Probably a similar situation existed between early Bariba and Oyo settlements to the west. Usman then identifies a period, starting from about the 13th century and continuing until about the 17th century, when a reverse migration of Yoruba people from the southern forests to the northern grasslands took place. This migration increased Yoruba populations in northern Yoruba land in general and in particular in the Oyo and Igbomina countries. As the numbers of the Yoruba increased, their non-Yoruba neighbors felt threatened. Settlements that had been originally wholly or partly Noop became predominantly Yoruba and the Noob, in order to hold or regain position, fought back. Again, almost certainly, similar developments were taking place between the Oyo Yoruba and the Bariba further to the west. It is significant that this period of increased frictions was the period of the founding of kingdoms in Yoruba land. As Yoruba kingdoms arose in the Niger area, they faced stiff opposition by the Noop or Bariba. The history of Ou, Ketu, and Ila illustrates the experiences of the earliest Yoruba kingdoms close to the Niger. Ou finally flourished in the country roughly west of Ife, but there is evidence that its first location was further to the north, in the Ogboro area, and that it was pushed south from there by the Bariba. The Kati kingdom first took a position in the territory to the west of the hills where Oyo Ila was later founded. Bariba opposition forced it to give up that location and migrate to the south, where it finally settled down. And the Orangans kingdom of Ila was forced to move from location to location for a long time. At last, in about the 14th century, Ila chose a good location and embarked upon building for its defense a very formidable wall system. Ila's city walls became famous in Yoruba land and Ila itself became proudly known as Ila Yara. Ila of the Great Walls. Protected behind its famous walls, Ila settled down and prospered, the glory of the Orangun finally shone forth. Even then the Noop never ceased harassing Ila and other Igbomina towns. In about the 15th century, the various Noop groups became united into one centralized kingdom under Adijai, or Tsod. With that, their aggression became better led and better directed, mainly towards the seizure of channels of trade. From Igbomina, the Noop broke south in the 15th century into Ijesa, northern Akiti and Akoko and even threatened Ilesa. Ilesa traditions count at least two Noop invasions of Ijesa, against both of which the Ilesa forces were victorious. At the same time, Ife sent armies, as earlier related, to Ara and Akiti to join with the Akiti in repelling the Noop. This situation continued until the 16th century. One very important consequence of the Noop and Bariba hostility was that the Yoruba lost some of their foothold on the southern banks of the Middle Niger. In the area to the west of the country where Oyo Ila was later to be founded, the Bariba pushed Oyo and Keta settlers down southwards. Further east, the Yoruba who had lived in the Jebamakwa area were absorbed by the Noop. The Gbadiji of that area are now mostly Noop in culture, but they were probably originally Yoruba. Bishop Ajayi Crowther reported witnessing some rituals of the Gbadiji on the Niger in the late 19th century, rituals being conducted in the Yoruba language and noted that the persons conducting the rituals did not understand the language that they were using. From the 17th century, a new development gave a fresh impetus and purpose to Noop aggression. The Atlantic slave trade was growing on the coast of West Africa. From then on, Noop incursions into the territories of their neighbors, the Gabagi in the country north of the Niger Valley, and the Yoruba south of it, increasingly took on the character of slave raids what some historians have described as smash-and-grab operations, with little consideration for long-term exploitation commercial or political. During the late 16th century, however, Oyo Ila emerged as a very powerful kingdom in the Oyo country. Its military power soon penetrated into the Igbomina country, a demise that began the process which was later to establish Oyo Isle's overlordship over much of the Noop territory south of the Niger. For the Ila and other Igbomina kingdoms, there followed two centuries of comparative peace, shielded by Oyo Isle's power. Noop incursions did not completely stop, but they became fewer and less effective. But then, two centuries later, by the second half of the 18th century, Oyo Isle's power began to wane. This opened the door to a new intensity of Noop aggression. Three of the Noop kings of the mid to late 18th century the Etsujai Brilu, 174,459, Magia I, 176,980, and Muazu, 178,095, are particularly notable for their violent raids. Many Igbomina towns is in Lu, Oba, Okaba, Okode, or Oago, and even Ila were either forced to evacuate or were reduced to tributaries by the Jibrilu raids. Weakened by internal dissension, 
Ila people lost the will to fight, and their great city fell to the enemy, their king, the Orangu Naruto, dying in the process. After evacuating Ila Yara, Ila people split into two, one continuing to bear the name Ila, the other taking the name Okila, both kings retaining the Orangun title. Not surprisingly, the two only became more vulnerable to noob aggression. The raids under Magiai were even more devastating. Magia's cavalry forces galloped on whirlwind raids throughout the Igbomina country, sacking and burning towns and villages and capturing men, women and children for sale. The flourishing town of Igbol in the Iluzin's kingdom, Odoeku, Oro, as well as many villages in the Ibolo area, near Afa, fell to Magia's attacks. So also did Gabagid, the royal town of the Aleppo's kingdom. The Ilupodala too died fighting at the head of his people, a fate shared by some other Igbomina kings. To the east of Igbomina, the territories of the Yagba, Abunu, Ikiri, O, Gbid, and Ooro, lacking centralized kingdoms, became easy raiding ground for the Noop. In fits and bursts, the Noop activities extended into Okoko and northern Ekiti. The Noop made a habit of stationing resident officials in ravaged towns, but, according to traditions in the affected places, the presence of such an official did not shield any town from being raided again and again. As the 18th century drew to a close, then, the kingdoms, towns and villages of much of the Igbomina and the Okan Yoruba reeled under the Noop scourge. It says much for the strength and resilience of the Yoruba kingdoms and towns in these places that nearly all survived. Kingdoms smashed in their original homes took their kings, political systems and religious properties, and struck root in other locations. Even the smallest of towns did the same. Usually, such groups sought sites that held out particular advantages, especially hilly places, where they would be better able to defend themselves. Also, trade survived. Yoruba traders and their noob counterparts, both mostly women, kept trade flowing, albeit with interruptions and in the midst of grave hazards. Even as late as the 1850s, by which time wars were even more widespread, foreigners who traveled through part of Igbomina and northern Akiti found trade flowing quite vigorously on the trade routes. Along the Eastern Frontier Along the Eastern Frontier, almost all the important developments impacting Yoruba people were concentrated on the southeast. Further northwards on the eastern frontier, their neighbors were all small national groups stretched out along the western banks of the lower Niger namely, the Kakanda, Ebira, and often Mai. Between each of these peoples and their Yoruba neighbors, much cultural interaction and exchange occurred throughout history, resulting in significant similarities in language and ways of life. The dialects of the Yoruba subgroups in these areas, notably the Okan Yoruba and the Akoko, bear strong marks of the languages of their non-Yoruba neighbors who all spoke Yoruba as a second language. Movement of farm labor appears to have been regular across the borders, resulting in many small Abira settlements on farmlands in parts of Akiti and Akoko. In the mostly thickly forested country of the southeast, Yoruba kingdom shared boundaries with the Edo and Edo-related peoples like the Akoko Edo, often Mai, and Ishan. This was an area of intensive cultural interactions resulting in mixed populations, common occurrences of bilingualism free borrowings among languages, pockets of immigrants outside their own ethnic areas, widespread inter-ethnic marriages, a free flow of trade and of human movements. Politically and in geographical features, the immediate Yoruba frontier was divided into two areas, a southern half consisting of mostly low-lying thick forest country, the home of the kingdoms of the Owo forests, and a northern, generally hilly territory, covered by lighter vegetation, the home of the Akoko kingdoms. Most of the intermixing of cultures and peoples took place in the northern half, where the Akoko lived in very close contact with their Akoko Edo and other neighbors. To the south, the Owo country was separated from the main centers of Edo population, and from Benin, by some 50 miles of the thickest forests in the Yoruba Edo region. Even then, the Olawo's kingdom of Owo and the Edo influenced each other's culture in many ways, to the extent, for instance, that Owo's Yoruba dialect came to bear a strong imprint of the Edo language. In the extreme southeastern Owo forests, the small kingdoms Ifan, Sobi, Ikaro, Ute, Imaru, Ajogbo all ended up having varying degrees of Edo influence in their culture and dialect, some had considerable populations of Edo immigrants. Some of the oldest and busiest trade routes in southern Yoruba land passed through this whole area, carrying trade between all parts of Yoruba land, Benin and the countries of the Edo and neighboring peoples. The city of Owo became the shining light of this frontier area a city of culture and art, the transition center of the flow of artistic traditions between ancient Ife and Benin. Available archaeological evidence reveals that Owo, an early center of the art of bronze casting, benefited from, and enriched, 
the ancient Ife and Benin traditions of bronze casting. Within Yoruba land it was, almost certainly, second only to Ila Ife as a place of art for centuries, before eventually superseding it. In general, Yoruba and Edo monarchical culture and royal regalia had a common base, characterized by a preference for beads as the precious adornment of rulers. In the course of history, the Edo took the beaded component of this royal grandeur and embellished it gorgeously, until the Oba of Benin, when adorned for public appearances, dazzled the eye in his superabundance of beads. The Owo, Okoko, and most Hekiti kingdoms borrowed liberally from the Seto tradition, as well as from Benin royal festivals, chieftaincy titles, and styles of palace buildings. For much of their history after the rise of the Benin kingdom, in fact, the Owo, Akoko and southern Akiti peoples of this area looked as much eastwards towards Benin as they did westwards towards the main centers of Yoruba civilization. In the traditions of these Yoruba kingdoms, however, the greatest emphasis belongs to the political relationships that developed with Benin. Founded in about the 12th century, Benin had by the 14th century unified all the Edo, and the Edo related Akoko Edo, often Maya and Ishan peoples, under its own leadership, thus becoming a kingdom of considerable power. Owo was the earliest Yoruba kingdom founded in the area, probably in the late 12th century also. Though Benin and Owo were separated from each other by a wide country of very thick forests and some fairly large rivers, the two soon established close commercial and cultural contacts relationships that were made the richer by the fact that both looked, spiritually, commercially and culturally, northwestwards towards Ife and were connected to that ancient kingdom through the same old routes. In spite of such relationships, however, Rivalries over the trade routes led to hostilities. The growing power of Owo seemed to threaten Benin's free access to the rich trade of the further Yoruba country, thus provoking Benin into taking military action. A first invasion in the early 15th century, led by a famous chief named Ikan, ended in disaster. The Benin army entered Owo after some resistance and took some booty, but when it started to leave for home, Owo people sprang a massive surprise. A rout followed and Ikan himself was killed. Many of the Benin men chose to make new homes in Owo and the surrounding villages rather than return to Benin. The rest quietly returned home. A number of less famous invasions followed, about whose outcome there is much confusion in Benin and Owo traditions. By the late 15th century, an arrangement had been made guaranteeing special protection for Benin traders in Owo and for Owo traders in Benin. Benin and Owo traditions agree that this arrangement included a provision that Owo would, from time to time, send a prince to live in the Benin palace but do not clearly explain the significance of this. Some Benin traditions claim that its implication was that Owo was subject to Benin, but others claim that the purpose was to signify Owo's continued faithfulness to the agreement to let Benin traders go peacefully through Owo to the further interior. Some Owo traditions claim that it was a means of emphasizing the new era of close friendship between Benin and Owo. As it turned out, this arrangement greatly served the interests of both kingdoms. According to Owo traditions, a large colony of Benin traders sprang up in Owo and a large colony of Owo traders sprang up in Benin. From Owo, Benin trade spread rapidly into Akiti and Akoko. Akure, to the north of Owo, became a major center of Benin trade, with a large colony of Benin traders. Another sizable Benin trading community emerged in the junction town of Igbar Oak on the route to Ilesa. Smaller colonies of Benin traders developed in Ikir, Adu, Ara, and as far north as Otun the Akiti town which Benin traders came to regard as a sort of outer limit to their trade. Owo traders also came to feature prominently, through Benin, in the coastal lagoon trade with the Itsukiri, Ilohe, Ijebu, Awari in Asia and, soon, with European coastal traders, when these appeared from about the 1480s. Wherever there was a sizable colony of Benin traders, they had the habit of organizing themselves into a community with its own chiefs, topped by a head chief with the title of Alotu Adu or Alotu Ikirin. They also developed the practice of sending their tributes to the Oba of Benin through their Lotuadu. Usually, these head chiefs wanted to be seen and treated as representatives of the Oba of Benin. Their unmet expectations in this regard came to play some part in causing conflicts with Benin. According to Akure traditions, the first coming of Benin troops to Akure, during the reign of Oba Uwer of Benin in about the middle of the 15th century, was caused by a major confrontation between the Akure government and the leadership of the Benin trading community over a dispute between some Akure and Benin traders in the Akure marketplace. After Akure, the Benin troops penetrated into southern Akiti to Ikir, Adu, Ara, Ogotun, Ais, Imur, in which towns sizable Benin trading communities already existed. According to accounts in the traditions, the Benin army engaged in no actual fighting in any of these kingdoms with the exception of Adu. While passing through Ikir, 
the army got drawn into some ongoing hostilities between Adu and Ikir. The details are unclear, but Ikir did succeed in winning the support of the Benin army for its forces preparing to fight against Adu. Apparently, Adu people themselves made this possible, misunderstanding the original intentions of the Benin troops, Adu rulers seem to have been hostile to them and to have made some attempt to prohibit their entry into Adu territory. Some minor fighting occurred between Adu men and the Benin forces, but it quickly came to an end in some mutual understanding and the Adu rulers then decided to welcome the Benin men and to allow them to come into and through Adu. However, the news of the fighting had spread to some of Adu subordinate villages, therefore, when the Benin men passed through these villages, they were met with hostility. This provoked a number of minor engagements, as well as the strange action whereby the Benin commanders took away some villagers found on farms and highways, from Ar, Afau, Aluamoba and Igbado, and resettled them in Ikir where they were made to settle in new quarters under their old village names. Some of the Benin men, returning home through Okoko, entered into some of the mostly small Okoko kingdoms. Wherever the Benin men went, some chose to settle as traders, artisans, etc., thus adding to the number of Benin settlers. In fact, the overall impression from Moo, Akiti and Okoko traditions about Benin's men-in-arms is that hardly any of them should be regarded as exclusively a soldier. Everyone was a trader, a herbalist or an artisan, blacksmith, coppersmith, beadsetter, etc., and the lure of opportunities for their trades far from home was a cardinal motivation for their enlisting in their king's service. Consequently, Benin men-in-arms tended to go beyond their objectives and roam far beyond, more or less like commercial exploration groups. Many also tended to end up settling in the places that they visited. Some decades after these events in the early 15th century, the news spread all over Yoruba land that some strange white people had come to Benin from over the seas. Then, the Benin traders began to come with exotic European goods. Benin wholesalers became sought after among retailers in all marketplaces, especially in Owo, Okoko, and Akiti. Trade along the old lagoon waterways multiplied in volume as Edo, Owo, Itsukiri, Ija, Ilahe, coastal Ijebu and Awari traders took increased parts in trading there, as far west as the Asia coast or even beyond. Since Benin was for a long time the main source of entry of European goods into Yoruba land, its increasingly large trading influence penetrated into the southern kingdoms of Yoruba land to Ikale and, from there, to Ondo, from the coastal Ijebu and Awari to the Ijebu interior and even to Igbato. Benin's closest interaction with Yoruba land remained, however, with its immediate neighbors the Owo, Akoko, and Akiti. After the first Owo Benin clashes in the 15th century, Benin did not come into confrontation with Owo again, and did not send armed men beyond Owo, until the early 17th century. The cause of the new conflicts with Owo was the challenge posed to Benin by the Alowo Osog boy who, according to the Owo historian, Ashara, reigned between 1602 and 1648. Osog boy had lived as a young prince in the Benin palace and, according to Benin traditions, was a very personable teenager and very much beloved in Benin. Strangely, without the courtesy of informing the Owo of Benin, he secretly returned to Owo which action was seen in Benin as a breach of the cordial relationship between Owo and Benin. The Oba of Benin sent envoys to ask the Alowo to make him return but he eluded the envoys. About one year later, the reigning Alowo, Omaro, died, and Osog boy, young, knowledgeable and ambitious, ascended the Owo throne. Osog boy came to the throne with grand schemes in his head, he would remodel the Owo monarchical system after Benin's and he would make Owo, militarily and otherwise, the equal or even the superior of Benin. His charisma energized his subjects, at his bidding they embarked on the construction of a gigantic wall system for their city. Owo youths were trained and drilled for war, until their young king was satisfied that his army was unequal to Benin's. His schemes worked. When the expected Benin invasion came, Owo was ready for it. The large Benin army marched into a well-laid ambush outside the village of Ud and was routed. Two other invasions did not do any better, although some residents of Owo villages and farmsteads were taken away as war captives. Benin's war against Osog boys Owo in the early 17th century appears to have led to a second wave of entry of Benin's men-in-arms into the Akiti and Okoko countries. The exact reasons for this are not known. Two small groups entered the Okoko country from the Okoko Edo area. Another small group entered Akuri. After Akuri, this group broke into a few units and fanned out into Akiti. Unlike the 15th century invasions, these 17th century forces included units that carried guns. The Akiti and Okoko in their traditions give the impression that most of the effect of the gun was produced by its terrifying noise. One of their sayings has it that when the king of Benin waged war on the earth, the god of noise, Ogbomadu, 
waged war in the sky. Another feature of these invasions was that some of the Benin units took away some captives from farms and roadways, not as hostages or Eru, slaves, but as people to be sold in Benin to traders who would sell them to traders on the coast. The fear generated by the rumors from Owo that Benin people would sell captives to traders from beyond the seas, according to Ekiti traditions, provoked hostility to Benin residents in some towns and villages. As had happened in the early 15th century, the Benin men again found themselves in conflict with the Adu kingdom. Apparently, because Adu was, as would be remembered, often fighting wars of expansion against its neighbors, the Benin had come to think of Adu as an overambitious and unfriendly kingdom. As the noise of the Benin guns reverberated outside the Adu city walls, Adu people took the decision that if the enemy entered their city, nobody should flee from the guns but everybody should die fighting in front of his compound. Consequently, when the Benin troops entered Adu, they found themselves opposed on every street. Almost all of the fighting was with traditional weapons such as bows and arrows, spears and swords. Adu people remember this as the bloodiest fighting ever in the history of their town. By evening, there were dead bodies in front of many compounds, bodies of both invaders and defenders of the city. The engagement became known in Adu traditions as Ogunolapana Kusupona the war in which all resolved to die fighting in front of their homes. Other Benin units went to other parts of Akiti. In spite of their guns, they were met with resistance in most places. One unit went all the way north to Otun and then attempted to go further north into the Igbomina country, by then mostly under Oyoil's protection. Just beyond Otun, some local Igbomina forces, reinforced by some Oyo cavalry, stood in their way and they withdrew. Following these events, some of the Akiti kings, according to some Akiti traditions, seem to have bought a few guns. However, there is no evidence that any Akiti kingdom ever used such guns in warfare. The kings who bought guns seem to have kept them as prestige possessions only. The occasional noise of guns from the Adu Palace, during some festivals, earned one Yui of the time the additional cognomen of Akulajarun, he who booms in the sky. Owo, Akiti and Akoko people did not experience another coming of Benin troops for about two centuries that is, until the early 19th century. For all the rest of the 17th century and the whole of the 18th, Benin suffered serious internal weaknesses of its own. Then in the second decade of the 19th century, Oguntuyi, the Adu historian, puts it as 1818, Benin sent some men into Akiti. The king of Owo was officially informed by Benin that their destination was Akuri and not Owo. Even then, Owo refused them passage through any part of its territories and raised a large army to enforce its refusal. Going by the ancient route through the forests south of Owo, around by the foot of the Orosan Hill, near Alade and Idenra, the Benin men, again some carrying guns, entered Akure. Even better than in the 17th century, Akure prepared to defend itself and killed many of the leading Edo residents. Days of fierce fighting followed, with the Akure forces led by the Deiji Osupa himself. In one of the engagements, the Deiji was killed and one of his sons was taken captive. From Akure, small groups of Benin men went to parts of southern Akiti and through Akiranadu to Otun. Adu traditions mention their passage without giving any account of fighting. The traditions speak of a minor clash between a small Benin contingent and the forces of the Otan kingdom, resulting in the death of some Benin chiefs. Other Benin chiefs then acted to revive the friendship with Otan, even offered their services to the Ur of Otan in a small war between Otan and one town, IA, that was in rebellion against him. On the whole then, there was not much of actual fighting in the Benin expeditions into Owo, Ahidi, and Akoko. An interesting perspective on the subject was given by the Or of Otun to this author during visits to the Otun Palace in the 1970s. According to the Or, the true picture was that Akiti kingdoms did not really see Benin as an enemy. The comings of Benin's armed men were few and very far between, no generation of Akiti people witnessed two of such, most generations saw none. The Oba of Benin was regarded as a brother to some Akiti kings. Paying tribute to the Oba of Benin was out of the question. Forming a coalition to fight him was also out of the question and so, for the most part, was making even solo preparations to fight him. In Adu and Akuri where bloody battles occurred, there were special factors at work. In Akuri, the large Benin resident trading community was irresponsibly ambitious and frequently came into conflict with the Deji's government. Adu people fought because they believed the Benin men were supporting Akir against Adu. Most people taken away by the Benin men as captives were seized on the roads or on their farms. Some communities that put up some resistance did so for fear of the alleged slave trading practices of the people of Benin. On the whole, the movements of Benin's men in arms appear to have been intrinsically actions in support of trade and traders. Benin was a great trading state whose rulers paid very close attention to its citizens' trading activities. 
The Oba of Benin himself was the patron of some of the most important trading associations that organized trade to various territories outside of Benin. It is in the context of the activities and traditions of these trading associations that we must understand most statements in Benin claiming many distant lands as places in which the Oba of Benin had influence. Alfred Dapper, using such sources derived from Benin in the 17th century, wrote as follows. The Kingdom of Benin is bordered on the northwest by the kingdoms of Olkami, Yabu, Isago, and Udobo, to the north by that of Gabu, situated at an eight days journey above the great town of Benin, to the east by the kingdoms of Izana and Forkado or Awari. How far the Kingdom of Benin extends from south to north is yet unknown, as some places lie at a great distance of eight or nine days traveling beyond the town of Benin, near Olkami. J. Barbet, using Dapper without acknowledgement and adding some details of his own wrote in the 18th century that the Benin kingdom borders to the northwest on Alchemy, Jabo, Isago, and Adobo. Its extent from south to north must be near 200 leagues. He also added the information that towards Alchemy, the Benin kingdom is very well peopled. Captain H. L. Galway, who visited Benin in 1892, wrote that the Benin kingdom had used to extend up to within 50 miles of Lokoja, at the confluence of the Niger and Benue rivers. Deciphering these statements is not easy. Of the place names, Alkami or Alchemy, as would be remembered, meant the country of the Yoruba. In that case, the kingdoms of Alkami meant the Yoruba kingdoms. Dapper's statement that the Benin kingdom was bordered on the northwest by the kingdoms of Alkami would therefore mean that, to the northwest, Benin shared a border with the neighboring Yoruba kingdoms, that is, the Owo and Akoko kingdoms. Dapper's further statement that the Benin kingdom shared a border on the northwest also with Yabu, Isago and Udobo presents a much bigger difficulty. It is not known for sure what Asago and Udobo would have referred to probably Isoko and Urobo. It has been suggested that Yabu probably referred to Ijabu. If so, then Dapper's statement in this regard would contain an exaggeration. The Benin traded with the coasts of Yoruba land all the way to, and beyond, the powerful Yoruba kingdom of Ijabu Ode, but the Benin kingdom is not known to have encompassed these territories. Ijabu was a name certainly well known in Benin as a result of the activities of Benin traders. Dapper learned that. To the north, the Benin kingdom was bordered by the kingdom of Gabu. It has been suggested that Gabu probably referred to Iba on Lower Niger. Barbot's statement that, towards alchemy, the Benin kingdom was very well peopled would seem to refer to the populous Sishan and Akoko Edo countries, the homes of many villages in close proximity. Captain Galway's 1892 statement that the Benin kingdom extended to about 50 miles south of Lokoja on the niger benue confluence is consistent with what is known of the extent of the Benin kingdom in the country of the Adrelated Afanmai, the eastern neighbors of the Yoruba Koko and Okan Yoruba. In this Afanmai country beyond the eastern borders of Yoruba land, the Benin kingdom had for centuries clashed with Anup. The sum total of all this would seem to be that the Benin kingdom with its vassal territory shared borders with Yoruba kingdoms to the west and northwest and a little to the north that it covered the Edo, Ishan, Akoko Edo and Afanmai countries, and that, along the western bank of the lower Niger, in the Afanmai country, it extended to quite close to the Niger-Benue confluence in an area where it was frequently at war with the Noob. It will be helpful, however, to supplement the above conclusion with local information on the Yoruba areas concerned. In an earlier article on this subject, this writer had suggested a considerably wider and deeper political influence for Benin in eastern Yoruba land. On a closer look at the evidence, however, and in the light of subsequently clearer understanding of Benin and Eastern Yoruba history, that earlier position can no longer be sustained. Before Osog Boy, 160,248, the Owo Kingdom had a sort of bilateral treaty relationship with Benin. From Osog Boy's time, Owo affirmed its independence more aggressively and became less friendly. In the bigger Koko towns, Benin, Edo, trading communities were many, and some of them were quite large. Apart from the leaders of the resident Edo trading communities, known as Olodu there were, at some times in the history of some of the bigger towns, Benin officials known as Balagale. The duties of the Balagale were to watch over the interests of the Benin traders and to transmit tributes to the Oba of Benin. The traditions of these places have it that such tributes were collected from members of the Edo resident communities and some corroboration for this would seem to be provided by the fact that, after the British had conquered the Benin Kingdom in 1897. Some Edo resident communities in Ekiti and Akoko still sought to send their representatives to take their tributes to the Oba of Benin. The situation would seem to be that distant Edo trading communities regularly kept contact with their homeland's rulers by sending their tributes to their Oba, especially on certain royal festivals in Benin, and that the Benin government reciprocated by sometimes sending men, or troops, 
to visit these trading communities and Valgale to live, and represent the Beninibai interests, among them. About the relationship between the Valgale and the local Akoko rulers, the traditions offer no clear information. The overall impression would seem to be that the Balagale had no significant status vis-à-vis -vis the rulers of the native Akoko communities. On the whole, Akoko traditions are very proudly emphatic about the Akoko people's love of freedom. Basic to their lack of large political units was a tenacious love of individual and community freedom, aided by the fragmentation of their country by rocky hills. Among the Akiti, Benin's influence was felt most strongly in the Akuri and Akir kingdoms. Akure was the Akiti city on the busiest spot on the highway connecting central and northern Yoruba land with the south and with Benin through Owo. Because the Adu Akure community that came to accumulate in Akure was very large, its leaders were often very ambitious for recognition in Akure. Their demands and comportment frequently generated conflicts between them and the Akure people, many of which escalated into serious communal violence, sometimes lasting for months. Such eruptions did not only usually cause serious loss of lives and property in the Aduakure community, they also disrupted the flow of trade and therefore attracted the attention of the Benin government. It was to deal with this situation, to protect the Edo resident traders and free the flow of the trade, that Benin troops were sent to Akure. The available evidence indicates that Akure never acknowledged Benin's overlordship. However, according to a statement by Akure chiefs in 1897, Akure used to send, for an unknown length of time, Yearly presence to the Oba of Benin probably briefly following the 17th century Benin invasion of Akure, the invasion in which Benin troops first used guns. According to the same 1897 statement, during the same brief period, Akure used to send messengers with gifts to inform the Oba of Benin of the installation of a new Deji of Akure. But even during that brief period, the Akure chiefs seem to have usually neglected or refused to send messengers to Benin while installing their king and the insistence by the leaders of the Adu Akure that it be done usually provoked conflicts. For most of the late 17th century and all of the 18th, while Benin was too weak at home to influence events in distant places, the Adu Akure seemed to have mallet and given little or no trouble, and the rulers of Akure had no trouble from Benin. However, in about 1815, when the Deji Osupa was crowned, the then leadership of the Aduakure community chose to remember a thing that had been long forgotten and began to make trouble over it, they protested the fact that the Akure chiefs had sent no messenger to the Oba of Benin, and they even sent a messenger of their own. This, together with an ongoing trouble over the killing of an Edo trader named Ogano in the Akure marketplace, led to very bloody conflicts between the Akure people and the Aduakure community. A certain chief Osagwe who came from Benin and presented himself as an official envoy of the Oba of Benin was killed by the Akure people and the conflicts greatly escalated. About three years later, as the violence was still continuing sporadically, causing serious material and human losses to the Adu Akure trading community, and which seriously disrupted trade, Benin sent an army. This 1818 war was a brief and sharp affair, with no known lasting political outcome. After it, Akure was never again to see Benin arms as Benin's power sank lower and lower thereafter. As for the Aduakuri, increasingly unsure of Benin's protection and patronage, almost all had become simply Akuri people by the end of the 19th century, although some of them continued dutifully to send their tributes to the Oba of Benin. Benin's pressure was never as strong in Ikir as in Akure. The Benin resident community in Ikir was much smaller and tended generally to harmonize with the native Ikir society. All in all, Benin seems to have treated Ikir as a commercial ally in southern Akiti. During the 17th century, as would be remembered, a prominent member of the Benin resident community, a famous hunter who was a close friend and confidant of the then Alukir and lived close to his compound, became ruler of Ikir. It is not clear how the transfer of governance to this man took place. Ikir traditions say that the Alukir often used the assistance of this friend of his in settling some disputes in the city whenever he himself was too busy with the rituals of the Alicenta. Most probably, the Alukir then died, and during the interregnum, common in Yoruba kingdoms, Ikir people continued to resort to the late Alukar's friend as judge in their disputes, the interregnum continued longer and longer, until the de facto leader became, more or less, a de jure leader, and when he died, probably while the interregnum still lasted, his son succeeded him and gradually assumed royal attributes and a new dynasty thus came into being. Ikir traditions are emphatic that neither the Benin government nor any Benin arms had any input into this important change in Ikir's political history. After it had happened, how did it affect Akir's relationship with Benin? Again, Akir's traditions give no clear information about this. A certain measure of increased closeness between Akir and Benin may be assumed, as well as increased benin Akir trade, but there is no indication of any loss of independence by Akir. In most of the rest of Akiti, 
Benin's political influence appears to have been about nil. About June 1897, a certain Joseph Williams, clerk and interpreter for the Niger Coast Protectorate, visited many Akiti towns for the express purpose of proving that Akiti ought to belong to the Niger Coast Protectorate because, according to him, Akiti towns had used to be ruled by Benin. He reported that Ilawe, Igbara Odo, Ogotan and Ara, all in southwestern Akiti, there was acknowledgement that some gifts and some tributes had been sent to the Oba of Benin in the past. The set preconception with which Joseph Williams had come to these places makes his account unreliable. Moreover, the well-known fact that members of Benin trading colonies in Akiti towns had used to send tributes to the Oba of Benin in the past creates confusion around Williams' reference to tributes. When asked about this later, in 1975, Ara chiefs remembered that the first white man to visit their town had succeeded only in talking to the leaders of the then small Edo resident community and not to the then Ilara and his chiefs, because the Ilara's palace and most of the town was still in ruins as a result of the Ibadan destruction of Ara some years earlier. Ogotun, Igbar Odo and Ilawe chiefs had no remembrance of William's visit. Williams also reported that the rulers of Adu, Otun, Ijero, Efen and other towns, though admitting that Benin troops had sometimes come through their towns and villages in the distant past, denied having been subjects of the Oba of Benin or ever paying tributes to him. The Southern Frontier Benin also came to have some influence in another part of Yoruba land in the small Awari island kingdom of Eko or Lagos, beyond the Ijebu coast. By the late 16th century, owing to the growth of the coastal lagoon trade, Lagos and the other small Awari settlements have come to have sizable resident populations of Ijebu, Benin, Ilihe, Ikale, Owo, Igba, Igbado, Asia and Ija traders. In about 1600, conflicts between some of the non-Awari communities on the one hand and the indigenous Awari people ruled by the Olofin on the other, was affecting the trade so much as to attract the attention of the government of Benin. Some expeditions were sent to the aid of the Benin community. The claim by Igarefba, the Benin historian, that one such expedition was led by the Obaragbua himself is improbable, and probably amounts to no more than a statement of the great importance of the westward lagoon trade to the Benin people at this time. For some time, the Benin and some of the other non-native communities, under the leadership of a Benin chief named Asheru, exercised some prominent influence and this much would seem to be corroborated by the statement of a German named Andreas Joshua Alzheimer, who, according to Robert Smith in his Kingdoms of the Yoruba, wrote in 1603 that Lagos Island was a military camp under the command of Benin officers. The Benin and Lagos accounts differ in a number of respects, however. While the Benin account asserts outright conquest by Benin people, the Lagos account describes many indecisive conflicts between the Awari population and the Benin and some other non-native resident communities, and an ultimate settlement as a result of which the latter came to have a part in the governance of the island. But the conflict remained unresolved, Asheru died soon afterwards in one of the clashes and a certain Awari man named Osipa, described in Lagos traditions as an Isri chief of Ife royal descent, but in Benin traditions as grandson of an Oba of Benin, graciously led the party that conveyed Asheru's body to Benin. The Benin traditions say that, in Benin, the Obaragbua was so appreciative of Osipa's gracious action that he accorded him recognition as ruler of Lagos. In any case, Osipa did become king of Lagos the progenitor of a line of Lagos kings. It is not improbable that, hidden in this picture as presented by the traditions, was a conflict or succession dispute among factions of the indigenous Awari ruling family of the Olofin. In that case, Asipa might have been the princely leader of a faction that sought and won the support of some of the non-native resident communities, especially the Benin. These non-native communities and the Asipa faction became victorious for a brief while, but skirmishes continued, and in one of them, the Benin leader, Asheru, was killed. After Asheru's death, Asipa further courted the support of the Benin by making the personal sacrifice of leading the men who took Asherah's corpse to Benin. With the support of his indigenous faction and the Benin and some other non-native resident communities, Asipa ultimately became king. In the present state of our knowledge of Lagos history in general, the above words seem the explanation most harmonious with known trends of the history of the island kingdom. In the development of the coastal lagoon trade following the advent of European trade, Lagos Island had become, by the end of the 16th century, a focal point of considerable importance, so important, in fact, that a very sizable number of Benin, Ilahe, Ijebu, Itsekuri, Asia and Ija traders had come to reside there. The politics of succession to the throne of the kingdom could no longer remain simply an indigenous affair. It is, therefore, in the light of such a situation that the early 17th century political history of Lagos would seem to be best understandable. 
We must now complete this section with a statement on the impact of the Benin Kingdom on the kingdoms of Eastern and Southern Yorubaland. Politically, as is obvious from preceding paragraphs, even in the regions of Yorubaland closest to Benin, Owo, Akoko and Nakiti, its influence was, on the whole, very small or non-existent. That does not mean, however, that the impact of Benin was small. On the contrary, its overall impact was considerable, but this had very little to do with arms, armies, conquest, overlordship, vassalage, tributes and such other factors and indices of military and political power and control. Benin was certainly a great kingdom for much of its long history, but the common assumption that all, or even most, of its impact was accomplished or sustained through the force of arms or through political control is certainly untrue. Adeo Bayemi says that even in the case of the many states of the Eda speaking and interrelated peoples now believed to have been clients of Benin, the Ishan, Akokoedo and often Mai, the greatness of the city, of Benin, the impressiveness of its culture, the attractiveness of its rituals and the prestige and power of the Oba were in many respects more important than military intervention in shaping, cementing or defining the relationship between them and the Oba of Benin. In the case of the Yoruba kingdoms of eastern and southern Yorubaland, Owo, Akoko, Akiti, Ilohe, Ikale, Ondo, Ijebu, Awari, Benin's influence was owed rather to the same factors, as well as to commerce, than to conquest and control. All the evidence from the traditions of most of these Yoruba kingdoms emphasizes the attractiveness of Benin. Benin was, to them, a Yoruba kingdom whose common citizens happened to speak a non Yoruba language. According to Ikem, as would be remembered, the Benin Palace almost certainly spoke both Yoruba and Edo, and Yoruba was the language of trade for most of Benin's long distance traders. The traditions of origin, the fundamental idioms, and the spiritual, historical and mythical underpinnings of Benin's monarchy were exactly the same as those of the Yorubas, but some of the presentations and expressions of Benin's royal ceremonials were different and exotic and, therefore, attractive. As the bronze statues of the earliest Tunis, made from the 12th to the 15th century, strongly indicate, the forms of Yoruba and Edo royal regalia, with their abundant use of beads, derived from a common Ife base, but in time, as earlier pointed out, Benin amplified the beaded elements enormously and very attractively. Popular stories about the fame of the Oba of Benin, the pomp and pageantry of his royal appearances and festivals, the elevated, dramatic use of the common properties of Yoruba royal regalia in the regalia of its kings, its stylized, glimmering, sword of state and the king's ceremonial sword bearers these were parts of the themes and subjects of Yoruba poetry and folklore and songs. Particularly, the fact that for eastern and much of south-central Yoruba land, Benin was the source of exotic imported European goods for about a century, added much to its fame and mystique in these places. Culturally, the Yoruba and Edo peoples were so close in many respects that they do not seem to have seen themselves as different peoples until the 20th century. To see traces of Benin's culture in any of these Yoruba kingdoms and interpret them as evidence of Benin's conquest and overlordship is to miss the point completely. The history of the Owo kingdom illustrates all this most clearly. Geographically, Owo is the closest Yoruba kingdom to Benin. Of all Yoruba kingdoms, Owo bears the strongest traces of distinctly Benin culture. But Owo was never conquered or ruled by Benin, in fact, Owo saw itself as Benin's rival. From the reign of the Ilowo Osag boy, Owo did become a credible rival with an impressive city, imposing city walls, proud multi courtyard palace, large marketplaces, a rich artistic culture, a powerful military establishment and empire-building ambitions and agenda of its own. For all these developments, the fear of Benin was a major motivator. Benin was the great threat that the rulers and people of Owo must watch and be prepared for. Yet, for Owo, Benin was a source of great trade and wealth. Even more importantly, throughout the history of the Owo kingdom, many kings of Owo wanted and tried to be like the Oba of Benin. According to Ilug Badian, some Owo kings, on their ascension to the throne, took cognomens that were called from the Edo language, because they believed that high-sounding exotic Benin names added to their stature before their subjects. Rinrinjenjin, the ninth Owo on some of the Owo king lists, created a Benin-type royal festival, the Agogo Festival, featuring a high-voltage royal procession very similar to the festive processions of Benin kings. Successive Olawos borrowed features from Benin's royal regalia to add to their own, until the point was reached that when the Owo fully dressed up for some festivals, he looked almost completely like an Oba of Benin. Attempts by Oa's rulers to remold their kingdom in the image of Benin extended into even more fundamental things. The Olawos in general admired the sort of power exercised by the kings of Benin over their kingdom. Under the system of succession by primogeniture, 
Benin kings were born and not, like Yoruba kings, selected from a pool of princes and did not have to compete within a royal lineage group. For a brief while in the late 17th century, Owo rulers instituted a system whereby each Oloa would be succeeded directly by one of his sons. It was so unpopular with the masses as well as with many of the chiefs that a return had to be made quickly to the traditional system of selection. But the greatest point of attraction for Owo kings was the power of the Oba of Benin to create new chieftaincy titles at will at all levels of the Benin political system. This enabled him to tilt the balance of power within any group of title holders at any time, with the effect that he could build support for his personal power in the political system and thus wield powers that a Yoruba king could not. The Yoruba system did not allow a king such personal latitude over the creation of chieftaincy titles, but successive Olawos bent the system, starting from the time of Rinrinjenjin. By creating new chieftaincy titles and vesting such titles with authority and influence determined by the king, the Olawos slowly increased their personal power. They also gradually pushed aside the foundational cadre of chiefs of the inner council, the Iyer chiefs, and confined them increasingly to ritual functions. The Iyer chiefs watched in dismay as this or that Olawo created a new title, conferred it on a friend or a total stranger, included the new title on the list of members of the inner council, or even made its holder a high official like a prime minister thus increasing his own personal power by putting in the highest levels and offices of government persons who owe their elevation and loyalty personally to him. These developments reached their most successful climax under Osog Boy. In fact, with the probability of more Benin invasions always hanging over his kingdom, Osog Boy ruled more or less like an Oba of Benin. Alugbadian describes the growing development as follows. Successive Olawos, starting with Rinrinjenjin had slowly reduced the influence of the IR chiefs by creating chieftaincies loaded with influence and authority, many of them held by persons who owed their elevation to individual kings and operated in ways that promoted and upheld royal prerogatives and absolutism, the Olawos had fallen into the habit of creating and elevating chieftaincies to suit their purposes, in fact, the tendency was that each Olawu tried to outdo his predecessors in the creation of highly bloated, highly glamorized, chieftaincy titles for his relatives, friends and cronies as well as in the pushing down of formerly exalted chieftaincies. The Ashuran, or Sashir, title tumbled from its lofty position, of Prime Minister. The Ojamu and Asho titles were created at the same time by the Olowo Amasan and belonged to the same level as first-class titles, but the Asho ended up as a second-class title, while the Ojamu title managed to stay aloft, close to the top, the newly created chieftaincies became. Without the IR chieftaincies, the new inner council around the king and inner council that did not have a name because it had no traditional basis for its existence. Alugbadian adds that by the end of Osog Boy's reign, the IR chiefs had become virtual outsiders to the governance of the Owo kingdom, a kingdom of their creation. The other chieftaincies were endlessly rivaling one another for royal elevation and endlessly being reshuffled down or up, and a configuration of power, as well as a disorder in chiefly ranks, unknown to Yoruba political culture, existed. Not surprisingly, these developments nurtured a tradition of endemic conflicts in the highest levels of Oo's political system. During a royal procession in an Igogo festival, the chiefs assassinated the Olowo Rinrinjenjin. Two reigns later, the Olowo Ogea started a new palace on Ikasi Hill, partly for the purpose of making the king safer. Before his death, he had finished a high thick wall around the new palace grounds, as well as many of the palace buildings. The Iyer chiefs complained that the new palace isolated the king from the town. After Ogeha's successor, Imajl, had completed his installation rituals, the Iyer chiefs put up an armed resistance to prevent him from occupying the new palace. Imajl had to fight his way into the palace. Given the plural nature of the composition of a Yoruba polity, the political changes alienated many groups, especially lineages, which felt displaced or threatened. During Osag Boy's reign, his charisma and popularity silenced most voices of dissent, but after he left the scene, it became rapidly obvious that the Benin type of almost total royal power was impossible in Owo. Lacking his charisma, Osog Boy's successors generally tried to rule like him, and thereby created a situation in which a collapse of the whole, political, system seemed a possibility from time to time. Political violence became common, and chaos repeatedly threatened. It developed that the newly created chiefs would start by uncritically supporting a king and then, after they had become well established, they would join the other chiefs in opposing the king's exercise of powers that had no basis in the traditional constitution. Usually, a king would respond by creating new chieftaincies and reshuffling the chiefly ranks, but that would usually buy him victory for only a short time. The king's habit of creating high chieftaincies yielded its worst result in about 1750 when the Olowo Adetapi, in order to set up strong support for his throne, 
created for his younger brother, Balyadipe. The title of Ojomo invested that title with such powers and assets as made the Ojomo an uncrowned second king. Even while the two brothers were still alive, the conflict between the Iloo and the Ojomo inherent in such a situation blew wide open and it was destined to keep generating profound disruption in the political life of the Owo kingdom even deep into the 20th century. The Olawas have considerable success, then, in their attempts to appear like the Oba of Benin, but their efforts to make the constitution of the Owo kingdom mirror Benin's only led them and their kingdom into serious political troubles. No other Yoruba monarch in the frontier area with Benin tried or succeeded as much as the Olowo to appear like the Oba of Benin, but there was hardly any that did not try at all. Even in regions of southern Yoruba land considerably removed from Benin, its royal culture had some influence over the packaging of monarchs and royal ceremonials.